Hi friends and welcome. Welcome to another monthly wrap up. There is nothing that makes you realize time is flying than these wrap ups coming about so quickly. This was a good reading month. I have a couple of non-fiction November books that I completed, a couple of shortlisted booker books, and I have uh, some historical fiction, and I have a dystopian science fiction book that I read, and I had a DNF, which will be interesting to share with you. Welcome if you're new here, my name is Angela. I am in Perth, Western Australia, and I just talk about books. Once a week I jump on here and just have a chat about books, what I'm reading, what I'm thinking, whatever. Every month I do a little bit of a wrap up about what my month of reading was like. I just kind of consolidate it all. I'll share a little bit about my month as well. You know, what happened, maybe something that was quite significant. So if you're just here for the books, feel free to use the chapters to skip ahead. I won't be offended much. Okay, November. November was a good month. It was a busy month. I have gotten all my Christmas shopping done, which is a fantastic outcome. I've been working on, I shared with you a couple of videos ago that I've been working on one of our spare rooms, decorating it. It's almost done. I just need my husband to put a couple of doors back on that room so we can put everything in there and finish it off, which is excellent. One of what I know will be a highlight this month is yet to happen in a couple of days time. Uh, we're going to go to a concert, a crowded house concert, which is an open air concert. So we're in Perth. It is coming into summer. The forecast for the weather is going to be a beautiful 35 degree Celsius day and I'm so looking forward to it. It's The concert is going to be outdoors in our botanical gardens. It's been a long time since we've been to one of those concerts but we love them. So we just pack a picnic, you just take a rug, you sit down and you know like on this grassed area and you just chill out and you watch the sunset and listen to this beautiful music and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So I need to figure out what I want to cook, what I want to take but I know that will be a highlight. Another highlight for the month was actually I went to something book related. I went to a book related event which was kind of fun. It's nothing to do with YouTube but last weekend I got invited to the Best Australian Yarn Award Ceremony that was held at the State Library of WA. I don't think this is a global saying but in Australia if you are spinning a yarn or having a yarn it is it means having a chat or having a, a story time I guess. So that is what the Best Australian Yarn is about. It's a short story competition and this is the competition's third year and this year there was 6,000 entrants. You can enter from 12 years of age onwards. It is open to everybody. You can be a published author, you can be a student at, at high school, anybody can enter. There are some parameters, you know, just the fact I think it's 2,500 words is the limit but it is an incredible incentive. There's like $80,000 worth of prizes available and the big prize is $50,000, which is amazing. I went, I took my mum, which was a lot of fun. We, uh, She is my bookish buddy. So we watched the award ceremony, which was really lovely. They had awards for a few different categories. There was a regional category. So if you were in a regional part of uh, Australia, there was also one for First Nation voices. There was one for comic books, which was interesting. It's a growing category of graphic or graphic novels. That was really cool. And to see the artwork that went into these was amazing. But I particularly loved watching the youth get their awards. There was a couple of youth categories and there, there was a couple of categories of 12 to 14 years of age. So what happened when they were announcing the winners, they would have some students come up from, a, from the Performing Arts Academy in WA in Western Australia and they would read an extract of the story. So the winner heard their story before anyone else really knew who the winner was. And so they knew. And so then there was this little buzz happening in a corner of the room and you knew that that person was the winner, but you didn't know who they were. And then they would call out the name and it would be quite wonderful. But there was to watch this, these young people winning these awards and their parents were so happy for them and proud of them. And these kids were so cool and articulate and really, really amazing. I really enjoyed watching that. And they said that the, the youth categories were actually up by 25% in terms of how many entries there were, which is incredible when you consider that kids are so distracted by so many other things these days, whether it's be social media or screens or whatever that may be. For the fact that there were so many more entrants in those categories is really, really cool and very, very encouraging. I really enjoyed that. So that was fun. I went to a bookish event. Look at me go. Other than that, I've been planning some summer reads and I've been buying books that I have absolutely no business buying when my 
TBR shelf is overflowing with books because we are on our way into summer. On the 1st of December, it will officially be summer here in Australia. Now, I know most of you guys are in the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, there are less than 10% of you that are in Australia. And I know I can't be all things to everybody, but I would like to know those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, are you interested in seeing what is going on here in the summer? I've got some fun reads this summer, I think. But I, I, I would like to know if you're interested in that kind of stuff or are you not so interested in the seasonal reading? I think that is something I might talk a little bit more about in the end of year book tag is what I've realized about myself as a reader. But I'd like to know if that's I don't know, do you have any opinion either way about what you're interested in seeing from me in terms of that seasonality and the fact that we are in this topsy-turvy, I'm down under and you're up there kind of thing going on? Okay, what I read in November. There's some doozies, some real doozies. The first book I read this month, which I think I might have read on the first of the month, was James by Percival Everett. I held onto this book. I guarded this book. I didn't want to just read this book at any old time because you can only read a book for the first time once. And I was hyper aware of that. And I knew that this was going to be something that would have, was, it was going to leave an impression on me. So I wanted to really be cautious of that. And I'm so glad I protected that moment. So I did read it before the Booker Prize was announced, but that that was kind of my end goal. I wanted to read it before the announcement. Ultimately, I started reading it and I just immediately wanted to go get a pencil and start underlining things, which I have never really had happen before with a fiction book. It was, re it was really interesting to feel that. I wanted to underline the things that I felt that Everett was trying to tell me, the reader, about these characters and this place in time and what has happened to them and what is going to happen to them. It was... Something happened, something flipped within me as I started reading this book. So a general synopsis of this story, James, is that we are reading a retelling of the story of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, and it is through the eyes of Jim, who is an enslaved man. Complete transparency, I have not read Huckleberry Finn. I have read Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. And I was going to try and read Huck Finn first. I'm actually quite glad I didn't read it first because it made the adventure so much more for me. I had no idea what was coming and I am looking forward to reading Huck Finn in the future and comparing the storylines and the character comparisons most definitely. So it's 1861. Uh, I think we're in Missouri. Uh, we're on the Mississippi River with Jim. Quickly we realize that Jim is not at all what we understand to be the stereotypical depiction of an enslaved man in America in the late 1800s. He is intelligent. He is kind. He is generous. He is funny. And I, I loved that. But he is hyper aware of his position in the world that is run by white people. And he finds out that he is going to be sold to a new owner in New Orleans and he doesn't have a second to think about it before he has to flee and leave his family behind and he decides that he's going to go to the nearby Jackson Island which is just a remote location that people go to for fishing and and that kind of thing he goes there to try and just formulate a plan of what he's going to do because he doesn't want he can't leave his family behind his wife and his daughter but while he's there he 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 is stumbled upon by Huck Finn who has just faked his own death to get away from his violent and abusive father who has just come back to town and then Huck Finn and Jim end up on this dangerous humorous journey up the Mississippi towards the free states of the United States. Something that hit me immediately was the lack of time that Jim had before he had to flee. He didn't have a minute to plead his case to his owners that uh, he shouldn't be sold, that he needed to stay. He was just like, "This, I if this is the rumor, I need to get going. And that really kind of hit me. Everett brought such a humanity to Jim that I connected with immediately even thinking about it now it gets me emotional and this is a fictitious character and I it, it's it was quite quite powerful and that really really did hit me so that empathy that he brought that I had for Jim was really really powerful there was no ifs there was no buts he he just had to flee if he was going to have any chance of trying to stay with his family and 
be alive. I really did enjoy watching Jim's relationship with Huck unfold and Jim's patience and tolerance with Huck was something that I really enjoyed. It really did speak volumes about Jim's character, about who he was as a man, and that goes on to develop the story later on, but I immediately I could see that at the start of the story and I really did enjoy that. So that's something I w- I'm interested to see if that is something that came from Twain's story as well. I, I don't know. As Huck and Jim go on their journey up the Mississippi or down the Mississippi, I'm not sure which, which one, um, They their journey is very dangerous and they meet a lot of people and Jim is constantly struggling with the lies that he has to keep, which if he slips, they could put him or the people around him in danger. But there, for, for such a serious subject matter at times, this is a riot of laughter as well. I was laughing at the whole dolphin bilgewater conversations. They, they were hilarious. But it would also smack you in the face with the racial injustices and uh, it's just, it's astound, it really is astounding. And it's a wonderful history lesson. It's, uh, I, yeah, I, I fully enjoyed it. This book begs for discussion, in my opinion. I think it will. It's most definitely going to be studied in schools, in book clubs. You, I want to. You want to talk about it with everybody. This is a wild adventure, and every chapter, every moment wants to be discussed. My own personal take on this was that throughout this story, when Jim. Jim is not illiterate. He is not like these, you know, stereotypes of slaves who are illiterate. He can read. He can write, and my. My take on that is that in Jim picking up a pencil and writing is that he is rewriting the story that Mark Twain wrote, and that's kind of what I took from it. And at the end of the story, I was just so proud. I was so proud of Jim, that James, that he, you know, the the journey he had taken, the decisions he had made. I was really proud of him, and, yeah, I... I actually closed the book. I put the book down and I just burst into tears and I don't recall the last time that has happened. It was such a wild ride. It was, but it wasn't like it was an emotional ride the whole time. There was so much adventure and a lot of humor and so many diverse characters in there that I really enjoyed. So I, it's, it was fantastic. There was a particular passage that I loved that I think all of us bookworms will appreciate. Jim is not as illiterate as he's, you know, as all enslaved people are made out to be, and he's hiding that fact. And this is what is going through his mind as he's trying to hide that. I could simply claim to be staring dumbly at the letters and words, wondering what in the world they meant. How could he know? At that moment, the power of reading made itself clear and real to me. If I could see the words, then no one could control them or what I got from them. They couldn't even know if I was merely seeing them or reading them, sounding them out or comprehending them. It was a completely private affair and completely free and therefore completely subversive. This was a wild ride. I loved it. I think I'll probably reread it again and I'm looking forward to the comparison that I'll have from Huckleberry Finn. The next book I read was Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. Ishiguro. This book was very much out of my lane because it is, while it is contemporary literary fiction, it is also science fiction and it is dystopian. Ishiguro doesn't need much of an introduction, but this is my first book of his that I have read. So this book was published in 2021 and uh, Clara is our main character and she is an artificial friend or an AF. She is artificial intelligence. She has this very childlike quality about her. And when we meet her at the beginning of the story, she is in a store. She is created to be a subservient, faithful friend to a child, some child that will choose her to be their friend, but they are most definitely calling the shots. And when we meet her, she is on display with varying other models uh, of AFs and they have there's you know different levels of features and different versions but Clara is an older model we keep getting told that she has some special qualities that are not quite usual where she is very observant she seems to interpret more of the world around her than the other AFs which make her unique and I don't want to give away too much of the story because my biggest issue with this book was that there isn't much of a story (laughs) It really is a very slow book, which I don't have a problem with, but it felt very vague, 
like it was trying to like there was a mystery there was something mysterious happening there was something dark lurking in the edges of this book and so I kept reading I kept thinking there's something that's going to happen but this vagueness just it just turned out to be vagueness there was no mystery it just plateaued and then flatlined and I it just didn't it didn't pay off for me I think it kind of felt like there was there was something that the author could have put in like there was something left out a major element that was alluded to but not put in and I don't know maybe because the conversation was around artificial intelligence and about how you know what makes humans humans maybe that was the entire conversation that Ishiguro wanted to have but I felt like there was something missing and so for me it was a little bit of a miss I loved the writing I really did like the writing but I don't know like we kept getting told Clara was different but I really didn't see it everyone just kept saying it but I didn't see it myself and unfortunately, it wasn't the Relevatoria book I thought it was going to be. So I think I will pick up another Ishiguro book. I think I'll probably pick up Never Let Me Go next. Um, I know that's another bit of a dystopian one. So maybe maybe that one or Remains of the Day. Remains of the Day is not quite dystopian. And I will give another one a go. But this one was just a bit of a miss for me. I Maybe I just, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't for me. Another booker. Another book of shortlist that I know many of you love is Stoneyard Devotional by Charlotte Wood. This book, this book, I have feelings about this book and they are all good. It has all the hallmarks what I would expect to have from Charlotte Wood, but it has so much more, which makes it a very unique reading experience. We don't learn the name of our narrator, but we join her as she is uh, visiting a religious community in the remote Monaro Plains in New South Wales and this is a, an area that she's familiar with she's been to in her childhood and she's come back there she's abandoned her life she's left her marriage her work her friends she's come back there and although she's not religious or believes in God she becomes a part of this religious community this book to me reads almost like a diary or a series of essays which is from the narrator talking about her time joining this community and then reflecting on her past which is a lot about her relationship with her mother or growing up in her childhood. I have to admit that that format kind of made it hard for me to find my cadence with this book because it wasn't linear like a normal novel. It was it just kind of it ebbed and flowed and so I found it hard to keep engaged in the book but it wasn't that I didn't enjoy the book for that reason. I just didn't feel the urgency to pick up the book each time I put it down. There was such an element of poetry to Charlotte Wood's words though. This it it had this it was like a cross between a diary and a book of essays and a book of poetry her, her her language her prose is so exquisite there was one line which was the silence was so thick it makes me feel wealthy which just i loved that line she she's an incredible writer and the way she takes something so pure and ordinary and turns it and gives it words that makes it come alive is extraordinary I've I've always admired that about her writing there was a beautiful little passage that is just so ordinary but the way she puts words to it makes it it makes it poetry to me it, this I would expect this from Mary Oliver or someone like that coming back from town yesterday car filled with groceries from the bulk buy place I stopped as I sometimes do to get out and stand looking down across the threadbare velvet covered brown bones of this land stones and low yellow grasses and the delicate strings of barbed wire fencing tracing long into the distance hot dry air zinging with grasshoppers the sky a vast white striated haze I just I don't know like this she's just it's wonderful but you see how like there's little tiny passages so it has that diary aspect or essay aspect of it in that sense which it just leaves it a little bit disjointed but the writing is exquisite it's worth reading definitely worth reading and the story is quite fun it is it is a little bit fun there's a lot of humor in here so when the character, I forgot to tell you what the story is all about. So our character who we never meet, we never know her name. She leaves her world. She leaves, she just 
abandons her life and her friends are very angry with her about that and she goes to this religious community and she joins them and she uh as she starts to acclimatize to their way of life and their that rhythm of life she she thinks back on her own life and things that things that have happened and then um there is this mouse plague that comes into this community and so they're dealing with this mouse plague which so we're in the middle of the pandemic as well so that's another element so this mouse plague comes and they're dealing with that and then there is another woman that turns up who is someone from the narrator's past so there is that element too so there is these little conflicts that keep popping up in her life that she's having to kind of reckon with I think that the the synopsis that it is meditative and moving is entirely correct on this novel it is well it was well worth the hype that it made it into the book a shortlist and I'm so proud of Charlotte Wood for that that she she was the first Australian in 10 years to make the shortlist of the Booker Prize and that is quite a feat unfortunately she didn't win but anyway go read Stoneyard Devotional if you haven't and after you have read Stoneyard Devotional go and read The Weekend by Charlotte Wood which I think I think it's a better book than Stoneyard Devotional but it's more linear it has a you know, it's just a simple, it's a story. And the characters in there are fantastic. It's a lot of fun. And actually, it's a Christmas book. It's Christmas in Australia. So there you go. It's a Christmas recommendation. <laughs> so um, go read The Weekend by Charlotte Wood as well. I would, I re really do recommend that one. Now I have a DNF. I tried, I really, really tried, but I just could not get into The Pursuit of Love by Nancy Mitford. I could not do it. I got 54 pages in which was Linda's first marriage, I think. I just could not connect with the characters. I couldn't connect with the story. And I I don't know what it was. I tried it on audio. I tried to read it. I just could not connect with it. So this is something that I'm struggling to figure out is what makes a book a DNF and what makes a book put it down and come back in a week. And this one I felt like is a not now. This is maybe in a number of years time kind of book. So this is like, I just was like, no, not just put this away. Sometimes it's just not the right book at the right time and sometimes it's just not the right book or the right author. And I wanted to try it. Like, I don't think this is a book where people say this is a five-star read. I felt like it was a important moment in time that I wanted to know more about, the Mitfords of people I wanted to know about. So I wanted to give it a go and it just wasn't for me. So I think I'll probably enjoy just watching the television show more, where, which is probably a little bit more engaging and easier to digest. Yeah, I just could not get into it. And I'm finding that a little bit with backlisted books. I think it's a little bit of the the nature of backlisted books. I'm trying to be more flexible with that and be okay with that. And I think the most important for me is that I, most important thing for me is that I gave it a go. And I just, I wanted to give it a go because I'm interested in the Mitfords. I've heard great things about the pursuit of love and love in a cold climate and what is it, Highland Fling. YouTubers that I really respect enjoy these books. I just couldn't connect with it. But there are too many books in the world for me to, that I want to read for me to get hung up and push my way through a book that I'm not enjoying right now. And the most important thing for me is that I tried it. I really did try and it just didn't work. Sorry, Nancy. This leads me into my nonfiction November reads. And the first book that I, first one I finished was Breath by James Nestor. This was wonderful. I get the hype. This was fantastic. Breath was published in 2020 and it is a fascinating read. It really is an ideal book for anyone that has any interest in health and wellness. And James Nestor gives some excellent science behind what he calls the lost art of breathing and gives a number of breathing techniques that you can apply immediately at no cost. So James Nestor starts the book with a an experiment on himself. It's an experiment to see what the effects of bad breathing actually do to your overall health. And it's an experiment he did at Stanford. But the results were really, really interesting how breathing through your mouth as opposed to breathing through your nose has some consequences to your overall health. And he talks about the health journey he was on, his own health issues, and the things that he had tried to do to, to combat those issues, which led him down this, this trail of 
of really seeing how it was his breathing that was impacting these health issues as well. And, and how he found that through urbanization, that us as a species, we just breathe less deeply and it's detrimental to our overall health. Some of the facts and research from some world-renowned pulmonauts was really fascinating. And I found the, the information around oral health the most intriguing. And if you've ever had children who have been told by dentists that their mouths are too small and they've got too many teeth for their mouths, I think you will find that particular information interesting in here. Because James Nestor is talking to some specialists about how our mouths have changed shape over time through industrialization. And it's not just how mouth breathers have smaller mouths and therefore the teeth don't fit in their mouths, but also we are eating softer foods every day and therefore our teeth are just not doing the job that they're meant to do and overall it's detrimental to our health the human body is just fascinating to me how the our body adapts and it becomes what we do what we eat what we see what we hear and it becomes what we don't do what we don't eat but then it can also change so when you change your breathing back to no nasal breathing as opposed to mouth breathing or you change your diet to more of a rough diet as opposed to a soft diet these things can change and you can repair that stuff you know within reason you really your body does pick up it really is such a fascinating thing it can go one way into a deficit or it can go the other way and it really does it's up to us to try and repair that to a certain extent. And James Nestor really does give some really interesting techniques in here. And he's showing it through his own trial and error. It's a very quick read, very uh, easy and conversational. I was actually painting a bedroom while I was, I listened to this a little bit on audiobook, and I found it very comparative to Michael Pollan's Cooked, which I listened to a bit on audio as well. The way they spoke was very similar. The way the book was constructed was very similar. How there was a lot of anecdotes mixed in with science. There was a lot of similarities there. Uh, so I kind of flipped back between print and audio in this book, but it's fantastic. It will deserve a reread, most definitely. I'm looking forward to implementing some of the breathing techniques into my own life for some stress reduction, for better breathing, better sleep. So many, so many things. I just do it. Go buy it. Read it. Please read it. Please read it. And I also read The Well Garden Mind by Sue Stewart Smith. This was another one of my nonfiction November picks, and I loved this book. This was this is another book I had feelings about. I was reading this book and I thought this was too dense. There was too much. As I was reading it, let me start from the beginning. I've been on a little bit of a personal journey for mental health wellness and how to cultivate good mental health in my own life. Enter The Well Garden Mind by Sue Stewart Smith, which was published in 2020. So Sue Stewart Smith is a psychologist and she is an avid gardener. And this book is about the connection between nature and gardening on mental health in everyday life. It's described as a book for people seeking a healthier mental life and it is absolutely that, 100%. So in terms of the format, uh, each chapter starts with Sue talking a little bit about her garden, maybe uh, something that is happening seasonally or something that has happened in her life and how she has gone into the garden and approached that. And then she'll go into something more topically, um, maybe around the impact of green spaces in urban areas or gardens in prisons or how gardens are helping people overcome addiction. Even gardens on the front line of war, which in World War I, which was incredible. I did not see that coming. There was a moment where I started to feel that this book was a bit more reference book than pleasure read. And that was because the information got very, very dense. But I think it was necessary. When I look at the book overall, I think it was a necessary part of it. And it was very cohesive. The story flowed so, so well from one story to the next that I, th I think this is just a natural progression for me into the next stage of looking into this topic. So I, I think that was just me adapting to the next level. And it has helped me gain clarity around my own mental health. It has given me some incredible insight into mental health awareness and into how nature contributes towards that. And, and perhaps even how being away from nature impacts that as well. I think as I'm also working through my own grief from my father passing this year, there is there was a large chapter about grief. It's called The Last Season of Life. And 
it was unexpected. I didn't expect this chapter to come about. And so it kind of hit me and it was not something I was wanting to read at the time, but I'm glad it came about. It essentially talked about how when you work, so I am a gardener, and when you work in the garden, you understand that things dying is a part of gardening. Things are going to die, things are going to thrive, and sometimes there is nothing you can do about it. No much, no matter how much time you spent nurturing a particular plant, there is a life cycle of a plant, some things just don't take. Working in the garden really gives you that harsh reality around mortality, our own mortality, and does help you understand that even though it is traumatic, it is a part of life and it is a part of the life cycle. So I think that has been something that has helped me through this. Seeing the words laid out in this book kind of gave me that gave me that space to, to really appreciate that. There was actually a, a passage in here about some of the writing is lovely. She's a wonderful writer and I, I don't want to harp on about death, but this is just an example of the writing. And I, th I think... I think this is something that if you um, go through the grieving process, you can't help but think about your own mortality. It's just impossible. You can't help but think about it. So this was something that really gave me a lot of hope about living well, right, living well and doing life well. Donald Winnicott was known for adopting a playful and creative approach both in his psychoanalytic theories and his own life. Not surprisingly, he also loved tending plants. He took pride in the garden on the roof of his London house and cared for his cottage garden in Devon. His wife, Claire, also described how he retained his talent for play well into old age, even continuing to ride his bicycle downhill with his feet on the handlebars. Soon after he turned 70, Winnicott suffered a series of major heart attacks which prompted him to start working on an autobiography. In the margin of his notes, he entered the following plea, "'Oh God, may I be alive when I die?' How many of us feel the same? Winnicott's cry from the heart expresses the wish to inhabit the world fully and be spared the depression that so often accompanies terminal decline. That really hit me hard. That hit me hard. And this was a magnificent book. It really was. There was so many elements to it. So, so many elements. And I think it's going to I think it's going to be one of those books that is going to be well read well into my later life. I'm going to read it over and over and over again, and it's become, going to come probably a little bit of a life Bible for me to take elements of and to find truth from and to live well because of the words of advice from other people that have gone through things. Anyway, I, I do recommend it. I'm already I, – I finished this book – maybe a few days ago now and I'm already every day I'm coming back to it to find that passage and to find that thing and to underline it and to to take it out again little things are coming back to me and it's I think it's going to stay with me for a while so if you are someone who is interested in uh, good mental health if you want to understand how nature affects our mental health how being in the garden can improve your mental health and your overall well-being I recommend it it's a beautiful book very well written the audiobook is also really lovely I also listened to a little bit of that while I was painting over the weekend one tip I think part of the reason I thought it was so dense is because the narrator which is the author is a very slow speaker so if you listen to the audiobook speed it up a little bit but yeah it's wonderful so those were the books that I read in November and it was a good little month you know, I had a DNF, I had a, not a great book, but you know, whatever. It's not bad. So thank you so much for letting me just chat about books with you. I got a little bit deep. I don't know how long this video is going to be. Thank you for letting me talk about books with you. Thank you for being here. Tell me, what was your best book that you read this month? If I had to pick a book, can I pick a fiction and a nonfiction book? If I had to pick a fiction and nonfiction, it would most definitely be James would be my fiction book and my non oh, my non-fiction book would be the well garden mind would be my non-fiction book absolutely that's a tough call that's a tough call what would be your best book of november i'd love to know thank you so much for joining me and i look forward to speaking with you soon bye